You don't have to solve all the world's problems in one go. That's not the expectation. Like slight gains are huge. And so we chipped away at it. We couldn't afford to become carbon neutral until over a year and a half ago. There's no easy place to start. You can't solve it all at once, but just start doing something better than nothing. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 231 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you for joining me today. I am happy you are here. And I have a bit of a special episode for you. But before I get to that, I just want to tell you, um, I'm actually launching a second podcast next month in February. And I am very excited about it. I am hosting it with Knox Robinson, who you may remember from episode 200. This is going to be uh, more of a heavily produced podcast, kind of in the Gimlet style of interview and, and setup, if that makes any sense. So we will be doing some kind of story. We will be having a, a interview with an expert. We will be having some key takeaways and we will be uh, featuring some kind of creative work from a runner within the space. This These are going to address some of the key issues that we feel um, are in the running world that we need to solve. And I'm just really excited about it. We have put a ton of hours in it already. We are also investing in it. We are really thankful to Tracksmith for funding us to allow us to do this. And I just can't wait to share more with you. I will be giving you more information in the coming weeks, but if you want to sign up to be one of the first to know, just so that you don't miss any upcoming information that we have, you can go to tinamuir.com forward slash new podcast, and you will be able to sign up there so that I will send you that information on it as soon as I have it. So I just wanted to let you know about that before we go any further. Now, today, as I said, I have a bit of a special episode for you, and this is one I requested. Um, I'm going to tell you a about uh, my relationship with uh, the brand Gooda, the sunglasses brand that you may have heard of. However, I did uh, speak to Gooda last year and I requested one thing if I was going to be working with them in the future. And that was that I wanted to have an interview with the CEO and or, and or co-founder. And that is because I... No, there was an incident a few years ago and I spoke to some of you um, uh, about a year after that incident happened and I knew you were still very upset. Um, You felt like you could not forgive them and I value your trust in me and so I wanted to find a way to make sure that I could give Gooda the opportunity to explain what happened, to talk it through And to show you that not only have they taken steps behind the scenes, um, but they've taken some really drastic things and they've learned from this. Now, for those of you who have been raving fans of Gooda all along, um, this episode, you're just going to learn to love it even more. But for those of you who have been hurt by Gooda, I hope this is some form of healing for you. I hope you can trust them again after this. And I really, really respect um, my guest today for the the way that he took this interview and the approach that he had. And just the nuggets of insight that were in this entire interview. I enjoyed it so much. And I really, I've been a fan of Gooda for many years. I've been wearing their sunglasses for many years, but I really love the brand even more after this. So um, I am excited today to bring you the CEO and co-founder of Gooda, who is Stephen Lease. And this is not going to be one giant gooder ad. I just want to let you know with that. And hopefully you know that by now with me. Uh, I had Matt uh, Taylor from Tracksmith on in the past. I've had uh, uh, Dave Spandorfer from Janji on in the past. Um, And I really try to make these episodes where the CEO comes on where they're not just one giant ad because I believe that's really important to make sure that we are actually thinking about brands from a person standpoint. Um, but I really do 
do a lot of vetting before I work with the brand. So uh, without any further ado, we were just going to take a moment to thank our sponsor, Athletic Greens. I'll be right to the episode with Stephen. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. I just want to add, as um, I keep forgetting to mention this, and I recently uh, got my family, my sister and my parents Athletic Greens, and my mum, let's just say, is not the the Greens type. <laughs> she, uh, she is not really a fan of many green vegetables. And so getting her to drink this was something that was going to be way out of her comfort zone. I told her to put it in a, when you get the the bottle, uh, to fill it all the way up to the top. So those of you who have already got it, fill it all the way to the top, put one scoop in and leave it in the fridge overnight or um, have the water in the fridge overnight and then pull it out and pour it in. I find that makes it taste really enjoyable. It's a good uh, dilution for me. And uh, I actually really enjoy drinking it. And my mum is actually really enjoying drinking it, which is really hard to believe and also shows you how uh, good Athletic Greens actually taste. But I do recommend adding more water than they recommend. Uh, on the on the packaging. So I want to add that out there. I just want to say, yeah, tell you a bit more about Athletic Greens. So it's 75 whole food source ingredients, including lots of vitamins and minerals. You can get the antioxidant equivalent of 12 servings of fruits and vegetables. And you're going to get a lot of those hard to find nutrients that you're not going to get otherwise. It's got adaptogens, it's got prebiotics, it's got probiotics. It is really going to look after your immune system, which we definitely need this time of year more than any other time of year. It's also going to look after your your gut health it's going to give you that protection and you get a free one year supply of vitamin d3 k2 which is critical this year more than any other year of our lives or maybe maybe not as critical as 2020 but pretty close at this point and uh, you will get a one year free supply that vitamin d3 is going to help protect you keep you strong keep you keep your immune system high and i have not found anything that compares to athletic greens that you will not find a more comprehensive supplement on the market rich roll loves it michael Gervais loves it uh, tim ferris this is his favorite supplement it is really a fantastic product and you can get um, that one year free supply of vitamin d3 k2 plus five extra free travel packs by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. At least take it through these first few months of the year. Uh, it's really critical to be doing. And yeah, you can go to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get that special offer. Hi friends, just a quick notice. I forgot to mention this in the intro that there is some swearing in this episode. So if you have little people around, you may want to switch to some headphones. Uh, just wanted to let you know about this because it is not typical to have a lot of swearing. Um, however, I don't, didn't want to bleep it out because I feel that is just part of who Stephen is. And I love that about him, that he is authentically himself. Just wanted to give you the quick heads up. There is some swearing in this episode. Stephen, thank you so much for joining me today on the Running For Real podcast. I am excited you are here. Thanks for joining me. Awesome. Thanks for having me. Now, I want to begin with saying, as someone who, and I quote, says, I, who thinks running is fun, that's, that's your words, you are automatically our kind of person. But you and I know that before we get on to getting to know you and this why you think running is fun, uh, we just want to... Uh, address something and I want everyone listening before I go say any more to keep in mind that not only is Stephen a real life human being although maybe part flamingo maybe maybe yeah. part <laughs> flamingo, for discussion um, but seriously though uh, he's a person and good at is a brand with 30 is that right 30 people oh we're 75 now oh my god wow way off way off, with yeah. 75 people whose livelihood depend on this brand, who care and love the brand. And as someone who's been wearing Gooder sunglasses for many years and purchased many pairs myself, I'm a big fan for some of the things we're going to mention. However, Gooder made a mistake a few years ago. And yes, it could have been bad in some, in some eyes. Uh, it did hurt people. And as much as I can tell you listeners, don't go look up the details. There's no need. I know many of you will, but just know it's a mistake. And on this podcast, I work really hard to show you my listeners and to show my guests and to show myself, even though we all know that ourself is the hardest one to do, that we need to um, 
give love, give compassion and understanding. And if we need to get, if we want to get better at forgiving ourselves and treating ourselves with this love and compassion, then we have to accept that we're not perfect and we're not ever going to be. So we need to understand too that brands are also trying to do their best and sometimes they get it wrong. But I hope you see that Stephen coming on here today is really brave and um, we're going to come on and just discuss uh, a little bit about what you as a what good as a brand and what you have been doing to uh, rectify the situation. And I want people to know that you didn't have to do this, but you did it because hopefully you trusted in me and you want to be there for the running community. Now, I'm going to get you to explain. Sorry, this is really long. Wind. I'm going to get you to explain uh, in just a minute. But I wanted Stephen on the show because I wanted the audience, you to hear it from the top that Gooder has been doing a lot behind the scenes, but not feeling the need to shout it from the rooftops because really that's real change, isn't it? It's not about being performative. It's not saying, look at what we did, look how sorry we are, um, because that's performative action. And we hear over and over again that that's not the way we want to do things. So just keep that in mind. Uh, it's a brand, but it's a small running brand who we want to support because they're a brand of runners for runners. And um, so I'm hoping people can use this as a, a path to forgiveness, um, even if they did admit they made a mistake and are ready to, to you know, fill in that gap and, and be the best they can be. So briefly, Stephen, a social, social media post missed the mark. It hurt people. You put out an apology statement saying, in the future, we're going to do our best to use better judgment. We've already learned greatly from this experience and we'll continue to listen to our community to learn and grow. So a few years on now, what, what does that mean? What have you done? Just like you said, Tina, most of what we've done is behind the scenes. You know, when we commit to um, really having better checks and balances, living with mu much larger empathy for the world, the things that we're doing when it comes to uh, not hurting people, not offending people when it comes to content is almost all behind the scenes. So the fact that you haven't, uh, it hasn't happened again shows that we're doing something kind of right. And so, you know, that's, that's a lot. I, I, um, I would say that when, do you want me to, do you want me to like, uh, give a little backstory, like to how it happened? I mean, you took, like, it's up to you. Well, I'm, oh, yeah. I'm here for you. I mean, I've said what I wanted to say and have people keep in mind as we're having this conversation. Um, oh, yeah. But yeah. Yeah. Let me let me give some um, context so everybody, you know, we don't have to talk in such cryptic terms. Uh, <laughs> so, yeah. you uh, have you ever gotten lost on a run? Have I ever gotten lost on a run? What kind of a question is that? Of course I have. Uh, many a time. Yes, <laughs> many times. So, so the first time I ever got <laughs> lost was Bulldog Loop in Malibu. So if any, any of your listeners are from Southern California and they're trail runners, they've done it. It's 15 miles and change, 3,000 feet of gain. It's really, really hard. And mm -hmm. the first time I did it, I did it with my friend Mike, who's actually our head of product here at Gooder. And by the time we realized how bad of a situation we were in, it was too late. And, um, pineapple gate is the same way. So the, the, a pair of glasses is called pineapple painkillers. So internally we refer to the incident as pineapple gate, but by the time we realized how bad we, um, messed up, it was just, it was too late. Like we were such clowns. And so, uh, to take everybody back, Gooder was started because we thought running was fun and your gear should be too. And so our content and our brand is irreverent. It's just designed to be fun at the end of the day. And so there's never any malice involved. Um, and so when this incident happened, it was, you know, it kind of shook us at our core, but yeah. we named a pair of glasses, pineapple painkillers, which we named after the tiki drink. And also at the time I was drinking a lot of, uh, just pure, uh, pineapple juice cause it's a natural ibuprofen. And, and so we just thought it was fun the day of the photo shoot. I wasn't there, but the props were forgotten. And, you know, we we're supposed to have like a pineapple and a tiki mug in this photograph. And instead, um, they had no props. And so they're, they're sitting there. It was for a line called non-perfection, non-reflection perfection. And so the backdrop was broken glass and somebody on location took Altoids and just made it look like pain pills. Complete mistake, right? Like, like just like, oh, we don't have a prop, pineapple painkillers, let's do this. And then when we posted the images, we made a joke that was, um, um, really tone deaf. I mean, there's an opioid, um, epidemic, uh, it was insensitive. It was just a stupid thing to do. And, and then it spiraled, right? We posted it. 
it was done late Friday. Today's actually the two year anniversary. It was done, which is really funny. Oh, wow. Like to the actual day, uh, it was posted late Friday. So by the time, um, like, you know, the internet takes things and, and mm. it, it was Saturday, you know, nobody was looking at it. And so it was this perfect storm of being out there too long. We did no, we did, uh, a first apology is just was, was a rookie move. At that time we were a company of 20 people. And then we did a, um, you know, took a step back, did a, we're like, Oh, we really fucked up. We, we, we hurt people. Not okay. Made a, um, made a formal apology, the commitment that you said about, and then, um, you know, moved on. And at the end of the day, this is 100% my fault. We didn't have plans in place as a company. You know, we didn't have an emergency PR strategy. We didn't have the checks and balances that we do now. And um, we have come out of it. And, and you know, we, we learn from it. And, and at the end of the day, I would like to say I wish it didn't happen, but I'm glad it did from the fact that we got to learn from it. And we got to learn that mistake early. And so we can get better and move on. Mm-hmm. Thank you for for sharing that and and giving some uh, context. I mean, I I didn't know quite a chunk of that. So uh, thank you for sharing that and um, putting some explanation behind it for anyone who was a bit confused with what was going on. And I really appreciate your honesty. I really appreciate the fact that you take responsibility. Um, And I I mean, in many ways, it is kind of, yes, it was a mistake and and it did hurt people and upset people. But that is the reason I wanted to have you on here because it was clear that things have been done, that it has been used. And as I said earlier, we are, I mean, I spend my days trying to tell people to stop being so hard on themselves, but that means we're never going to be less hard on ourselves if we continue to be really hard on everyone around us. And I'm not saying that, I mean, you, you said you clearly messed up, um, but you also have, um, taken this step here where you could have just said, you know, I, we don't want anything to do with this. Like let's just brush it under the carpet. You've come on here. You've said you've done stuff internally. And it, maybe would you share a few of those things that you have, have done, um, just to, you know, make sure that something like that doesn't happen again. Yeah, for sure. You know, one, just, you know, if anybody's ever been a part of a fast growing company, the laundry list of things, Tina, that start showing up that you never thought you needed to have a plan for or deal with would barely fit in the Grand Canyon, right? It is, it is long. And so this, this was one of them. And, um, so anything from content wise, making sure that, um, we are, uh, having fun, but at nobody else's expense. And so there, um, we now we have a person on our team that kind of reviews everything and we do it by more of a committee so that multiple eyeballs are on it. And, you know, I'm in the naming meetings for our glasses and all the time in those meetings, we're really big on not censoring to start off with, but we walk back names all the time. We're like, Oh, that's not cool. Like that, that seemed a little sexist. Like that's, that's not an okay thing to say out loud. And so it was really the the big thing was inserting a step for reflection and bringing um, more eyeballs to to the approval process of uh, names and copy so that this doesn't happen in the future. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. And I'd love if you're willing to discuss uh, for a minute, it has to be hard to walk the line of, uh, you know, brands. And, and I even include myself in this as, as a very small brand uh, are encouraged to, to be yourself, be authentic, be vulnerable, be bold, stand out, um, push out of your comfort zone, all these words that, uh, you have to try and incorporate into, into the personality of a brand. Yet one wrong move, as you discovered, can put a mark on you for the the rest of the brand's life. So that potentially people will never trust you again. And that's where I hope we are. Those people who are, were feeling hurt are, are able to forgive after this conversation, but does, does that ever bring you any kind of anxiety? Um, and I know I feel that with the some of the things I share that I want to be vulnerable, but people could always twist something that I say into a into a way I didn't mean. For sure, um, it, for sure brings anxiety. You know, I our brand is when you talk about thinking of running is fun. I mean, that was really the impetus for the brand, and we didn't feel like a lot of other brands represented who like like what we felt and in. Uh, I'll do these, this talk sometimes and I have this, uh, 
a slide that has eight different Instagram photos of a, of a brand. And the punchline is this isn't a one brand with eight photos. This is eight brands, but they all look the same. And our goal is to not, we want to, you know, we really make a point not to water down the brand, but it is hard. Cancel culture is real. And so for us, um, you know, the, one of the big practices that I think has helped is as we grow, you know, at one point I used to do every job at the company and that included answering customer service. And, and when it's your baby, you get attached. And so the more you can kind of put layers in, it helps, uh, in a, in a weird way so that you don't take things so personally. And so I think that's one trick, but I think the other trick is that understanding we're not going to be everything to everyone and that's okay. As long as we aren't assholes and as long as we're not, there's no malice, then we can, we're free to be ourselves and just, it's, and, 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 you know, we have a mantra here. One of our core values is authenticity. And uh, the mantra for that is if the goal is being authentic and people don't like you, it's okay. If the goal is being liked and people don't like you, you're screwed. And, mm -hmm. and so we really just try and focus on being ourselves and let the people that like us uh, show up and support us. Yeah. And, and I think that's definitely come out in, in that you have raving fans that are just, I mean, I actually count myself as one of them who um, love, love the product, love the personality, love the silly little things that are included with the glasses, uh, <laughs> or like the instructions and things like that. Like, I mean, I, I just think it's really cool. And I'm, I'm glad that personality does shine through. And you said there about um, it feeling like a child. And I, I wondered the same thing. Like, how do you let go of that negativity that is undoubtedly going to be directed at your brand, you know, often? And we all, everyone listening experiences that uh, pokes or jabs at your biggest insecurities or just parts of you, uh, be it by family members, by friends, by someone on the internet, whatever. But how do you not get defensive when it, like you said, it must feel like your child is being attacked when you started this brand from the very beginning? Yeah, for sure. I mean, it, it is hard at times. I mean, I'll tell you a funny story about Pineapple Gate that, that I think people can resonate with is when it happens, it was all consuming. And um, my partner happened to be in town and there was three of us at the company that like when it was going on had a two hour drive and this, it's all we could talk about. And it was all consuming. And in the middle of it, I said, time out. I go pineapple break. So here's what a pineapple break is. If you call it, you cannot talk about this incident for two hours because it's, it's just all consuming. You, you get all worked up. And so that was something that we actually will still do here jokingly, like pineapple break, like let's stop circling. This isn't serving anybody. And so you know, practices like that. And, and also with as many people that, um, took issue with what happened um, with pineapple painkillers, we had people also that sent us email that just loved our brand. Like, Hey, we support you. Um, mm -hmm. at the end of the day, it, you know, at the end of the day, it, we didn't, we didn't see a downtick. Like when we kind of like did a, a dissect of everything that was going on, um, the influx in traffic was not our current customer base. And so just taking those under things in stride, like, Hey, our brand's not for everybody and, and it doesn't need to be. And so, you know, it's, it's not, there's not a clean answer to this. I mean, you know, you put yourself out there all the time with your media and yourself and, and you, you make yourself a target. And so the practice for me is, uh, how do I, you know, live in empathy, let go and, and not try and people please. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and it's easy to, to say that and it is, it's tough to do, but I can definitely feel it within your words that you, you do practice that and you do believe in that. And, uh, and thank you for, for again, sharing another part of, of that, of that journey and, and what it has taught you. And, um, so related to that, big corporations have this bad rap and, Many of them, quite frankly, deserve it. Um, <laughs> but why do you have any insights on why you think we can get caught up and do the same to smaller brands that we know are making our community better? I mean, you mentioned 75 people work at Gooder, and I'd imagine a good chunk of them are runners. Uh, now, I'm not saying I haven't done this. I have told Delta about probably 10 plus times in my life that I'm never using them again <laughs> after a bad experience. Yeah. I somehow go back over and over. So I've done this too, but, um, I mean, they're not definitely not a small brand, but why is it that you, that sometimes 
we what do you think we we get caught up in and use that um i don't know like bad guy um approach towards smaller brands as well yeah i mean it's a great question i I think part of it is it feels so good, right? I mean, I, there's been science. If anybody listens to Brene Brown. Oh but, my God. You might need to like, talk to me about Brene Brown. Yeah, love Brene <laughs> Brown. Uh, Dare to lead is a part of the onboarding process here. Oh, um, it. yeah. And, but you know, she talks about like the sciences is, is people, um, it's easier to gravitate and connect through talking shit than it is to, mm -hmm. to talking praise. So I think there's something real about that, that it's a, it just, it's so seductive to, to want to like throw shade. And so I think that's part of it. Um, and then I think a lot of it is, um, you know, insecurity probably. Um, it's hard because sometimes people and brands do things that, that they need to get skewered for. But the most of the time, if, if some, for me, if somebody fucks up, as long as they own it, as long as they own it, I actually will forgive and forget in a moment. And so I don't know the easy answer, Tina. I think we live in a world where, it's easy to um, uh, point fingers than it is to look inside. Yes. Well, and Brene has that, oh, it's not even her quite, is it Roosevelt quote she always talks about, about yes. um, not being marred in the dust and dirt in the arena. I can't remember what she says. Um, yeah. You get to point fingers from the start. I can't remember. Um, yeah, it's, exactly yeah, it's, it's, it's the, yeah, it's her, uh, it's, Dar it's the Daring Greatly quote by Roosevelt. Mm -hmm. Um uh, it's not the critic who counts, not the man who points out how the strong man stumbles or where the doer of deeds could have done them better. The credit belongs to the man who is actually in the arena, whose face is marred by dust and sweat and blood, who strives valiantly, who errs, who comes up short again and again because there is no effort without error and shortcoming, but who does actually strive to do the deeds, uh, who knows great enthusiasm, uh, the great devotion, who spends himself in a worthy cause who at best knows in the end triumph of achievement and who at worst, if he fails, is at least fails while daring greatly. And I would much rather fail while daring greatly than not play the game. Did you just, mem did you just recite that from memory? I used to do it. I used to, I used, used to be part of a talk I would do. So I, oh, I, wow. it's, I probably paraphrase, I probably missed a line, but that's pretty close. Yeah, uh, no, that's, that's how I remember. So, wow. <laughs> I, 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 I memorized it on purpose <laughs> a while ago. <laughs> that's so cool. All right, so let's get on to running. Uh, first thing I want to ask you about, it says on your website that you won a beer mile. So are you a regular beer mile participant or was that a one and done and you've won and you're going out on a high and never do it again? Oh, I mean, I've you know, I've won one. Uh, I, I will totally do it again. I... Uh, it's been a while. I mean, in, in COVID times that I think standing around, like, you know, no mass drink, slamming beers with people's, you know, not acceptable, but, yeah. um, yeah, I mean, my running journey is interesting. I, I came to it late in life. I, I always kind of jog casually, but I didn't run in high school, didn't run in college. And then in 2012, um, when I was 30, I decided to run my first marathon and it was LA marathon, um, uh, mile 16, my legs completely cramped up. They froze felt awful and became glaringly obvious. I did not train hard enough. Um, finished with a five hour marathon, but I loved it. I love the abuse. I love like the camaraderie. And, um, at that time I just finished running, finished reading born to run, which is, you know, like the Bible yeah. for, <laughs> for runners. And I said, you know, six months later, I, I, that first marathon was five hours. I was like, I want to run a sub four. So six months later I ran my second marathon sub four. Then I'm running a marathon every three months and every two months. Then I get into ultras. And in 2017, I ran my first hundred miler first and only. Yeah. Yeah. I'm going to ask you about that in just a minute, but, but going back to the marathon, um, did you do any, any distances along the way? Or was that one of those, I'm 30 years old, I need to do something with my life, early, early midlife crisis moments? Yeah, you know, what's, what's, what's interesting, probably somewhere deep in there, my, I lived in downtown LA at the time, and my good friend who lived in the same building as me, he's like, hey, I want to do this, do you want to do it? And I'd always wanted to run a marathon, and I could like mm -hmm. walk to the start line. And so it was just lucky circumstance. And um, my training for that was just not where it needs to be. I think the longest run I did training for that was 13 miles, but I didn't know, I didn't do like the buildup like you probably should do, uh, uh, to get to that distance. 
Yeah, yeah, and uh, I, I'm sure you, uh, many runners have have done that too, and uh, you will certainly not be the last to, uh, to <laughs> no. make that mistake either. Uh, so, but you know, getting to where you've done a hundred mile, that is absolutely no easy feat. So, what was the decision to 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 go to that extreme? I mean, that is something that takes. You're not going to finish it if you don't do the do the work to get to get there. So, uh, what was the impetus for that? Yeah, I mean, you're not wrong. I I legit worked two full time jobs. I ran gooder and ran um, probably 25 hours a week. Um, so, what's funny is early on, when, you know, when you start running and you meet kind of run friends, and there's always somebody better than you. That's one of the funnest things about running is there's just always somebody around the corner that is way faster than you, and I remember meeting people who are hundred mile runners and, and, and literally saying out loud, there's no way I would ever do that. Yes. And flash forward to being around enough people, enough friends, you run enough. You're like, Oh, so-and-so's done a bunch. So-and-so's done a bunch. And then all of a sudden something that seemed unobtainable in a moment is like, Oh, I can, I can do this. Like th- this is obtainable. It's not going to be easy. And so that's where that came from. It was just, it was to prove to myself that I could do it. Yeah. And was it as hard as you expected? Yeah, for sure. I mean, I was getting up every Friday, running a full marathon, going to work, then getting up Saturdays and running another marathon. Like that was legit my, my back to backs I was doing and it was really hard. It was physically taxing. And, and by the time the race came, I was burned out. Like I had I remember I finished my real, my last really long run three weeks before and just like, like just like throwing my backpack on the ground in a parking lot because I was just so worn down and, uh, went to the race and, um, had highs and lows like everybody does, but I finished and it was wonderful. It was, you know, like magical. It wasn't a picnic. Like there were times where I didn't think I was going to finish, but, um, I, at, 30, at mile 38, my legs completely froze up. It was really hot, and I just fell over face first into the dirt. Thank you to Momentus for sponsoring this episode of the Running For Real podcast. And if this episode hasn't really made it clear enough, it really is important to me that the brands that I work with, I believe in the heart, the nature, the just genuineness of the companies. And that is why I am really, really picky about which brands I work with. It has to be more than their products. It has to be about them as people. And I usually do require getting to know someone pretty high up to make sure that I do feel like their heart is in the right place and that they're building a culture that I believe in. And I definitely feel that is the the case with Momentus. I've really enjoyed getting to know their founder and CEO, Matt Wan. And uh, today I want to tell you a bit about cre- their creatine. Momentus Performance Creatine is this pure energy SF certified for sport creatine monohydrate formula. Now creatine is an amino acid that supports increased energy production and muscle power output. So it's primary role is the recycling of ATP, going back to your science lessons there, um, which is the main source of energy for muscle and brain cells. Creatine also promotes lean body mass and cognitive function. So we can benefit from this in our running and within our lives. It can benefit any athlete, particularly aging athletes whose natural uh, amount of creatine will decrease over time. So if you are a older runner and you are struggling with injuries or you are struggling with your running, just getting your feet back under you, this might be something you want to consider. So creatine can also act as an antioxidant in the brain, which not many people know, which I think is pretty cool. And actually there is a video on, I'll put one in the show notes for today, um, talking about why about the science behind creatine, why it is helpful for runners, what it's going to help you do. So definitely recommend the Momentous Creatine and you can get 20% off your order. So you can go get my three favorite products, which are Collagen, Elite Sleep and Creatine, or just one of those if you prefer, uh, by going to livemomentous.com. And if you use code TINA, you will get 20% off. That's livemomentous.com. And using code TINA, you will get 20% off your order. So that creatine is going to be a wonderful thing you can take to help with your recovery, to help with your um, body just being able to handle the training. And as we mentioned, cognitive function, who couldn't benefit from having a better cognitive function? Thank you so much for listening to this and thank you to Momentus for sponsoring this episode. 
it was wonderful. It was, you know, like magical. It wasn't a picnic. Like there were times where I didn't think I was going to finish, but, um, I, at 30, at mile 38, my legs completely froze up. It was really hot. And I just fell over face first into the dirt. Like I was going up the side of a hill and I had to regroup, um, blah, 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 blah. But after that race, I would always joke whenever you're training or any situation, be like, I've been in way worse situations than this. One that comes to mind is mile 38 of a hundred mile race. And so it gets you, it gets you perspective real quick. Yeah. I guess it always gives you that thing of, uh, no matter what situation you're in, you, you can always reflect back to that and be like, well, if I can do 100 miles in one go, then I can certainly get myself through this. Um, has that changed the the way that you are able to approach things for for good or bad since that race in any way i mean i i wonder if any does it help you with motivation if you're trying if you if you were going to jump in a race now if you are trying to do something hard or does any part of it go the other way that maybe you're like well what's the point of doing this uh um, yeah. this, is, this is stupid kind of thing yeah. I mean, well, one, I haven't done one since. I mean, I think I would pr- I'll probably do one again, but I think there is an ignorance is bliss. So, you, so I think the second one will probably be harder. Uh-huh. Um, you know, I, a gooder, we have this, um, um, term called, sh- you know, sharpen your ax and, uh, it's, it's, it's pulled from a Abraham Lincoln quote. That is if, if I had eight hours to chop down a tree, I'd spend six of them sharpening my ax. Mm-hmm. And, and what I love about that quote and the analogy for runners is spot on is, when you train to run a marathon, you start six months um, ahead of time, right? And you're getting up at 6 a.m. every Saturday and you're running eight miles, then 10, then 12, then 14, then 16, then 20. And you're doing speed work on Tuesdays and mid midweek runs. And you're doing all this work, Tina, for one four-hour period, six months in the future. Yeah. That's it. You, that's it. You're sitting there and you're just, you want, you want your ax razor sharp. So when you show up on race day, you can give it all you got and you can beat your chest when you finish because you worked your ass off. And, um, the benefit is the mentality of like, I can see something way far in the future and I can do the million steps that's going to get me there. And so I think that is the gift that it gave me. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I I mean, I love that. Although there's one thing you missed from, from that. And that's the, uh, the absolute panic that runners are in in the the morning of even though the axe is uh, as sharp as it can be they they feel like uh, the handle's going to fall off or something um in the in the half an hour before the race or the eight hours before the race 100% 100% <laughs> right. I mean, I had a run coach a, long, a while ago say, you know, uh, here's the thing with any race. Uh, two things are going to go wrong that you know about and two things that you don't. So good luck. Mm-hmm. Like, like, oh no, that's, that's terrible. That's a terrible feeling. I know. Yeah. But, uh, and everyone listening definitely can resonate with that. And what is, <laughs> what does a typical week of running look like for you now? You know, running a, co- I mean, you were running your company there as, as well, but, uh, in a normal phase of life when you're not training for a crazy race, uh, what does it look like now? Yeah, right now, I mean, one of the silver linings of the pandemic for me was getting a more regular run practice. So uh, right now I do, um, I have a, a, a run with a friend every Tuesday and then I do, um, so I just do a five mile, a fast five miles on Tuesday, a, uh, a light run on Thursday and then something over 90 minutes every Saturday. Uh, and then I ride, you know, ride my Peloton and work out in between. But right now I just, I burn myself out on the hundred miler and yeah. I, was like, I was like, you know what? I love running. I want to run for me. And so that's what I do. I probably do, I don't know, 20 miles a week right now. Yeah. And so hearing that, uh, if that is somewhat of a normal, a normal week for you, do you think that anyone listening could, if they'd always thought maybe I would like to do a hundred miler and hearing that you are, uh, an, quote unquote normal person who isn't running 80 miles a week on your typical uh typical week do you believe that any runner could train for a hundred miler if they if they really wanted to and if they were you know prepared to do the work 100 percent. i am not a naturally like gifted person like, like i'm fine um you know it took me you know, five years of like consistent running to work up to it but i yes i've paced i've paced some people here's the thing if um if you are willing to put in the work, I actually, well, I, I think a hundred miler is, you know, way easier than running a sub three, um, real marathon in full transparency. Uh, 
it's a lot more, it's a bigger time commitment, but you don't have to go into the pain cave as hard as you do when you, when you run those really fast times. And so the answer question, yes, absolutely. If you really put in the time, it's, it's attainable to any normal runner. That is, uh, that's pretty interesting to hear what you said about sub three is that as you are someone who, I mean, I don't know what your marathon PR is, but are you right on the edge of where it was my, it, it, my, my marathon PR is 323. I really wish I would have tried for three sub three kind of in that era because I was really, really fast. I'm nowhere near there now. Um, it is something I kind of fetishize about, uh, mm. training for, cause I think that it, you know, it is a, it's a whole other challenge, but, um, yeah, but I, I've, I've never, I've never intentionally tried to train, train for a sub three, but I know what it was like to be that fast. And I, I think it's harder to, to run a sub three than a hundred miler. Well, I may, I may find out that for you. Uh, <laughs> um, well, um, I may find out too someday. Um, we'll, yeah. we'll, we'll compare notes. Let's do it. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Let's check in in a few years. Well, actually, give me a little more than a few years. A hundred miles seems just like I'm still in that almost impossible phase. Uh, although I've mentioned this before that have you seen the Billy Yang video uh, yeah. of his that video? I mean, I swear, if anything convinced me that it was possible watching, uh, like, you know, I've talked to tons of ultra runners, but that video, there's something about it uh, that really got me questioning, could I? So, sure. uh, yeah. I think we should check 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 in again in a few years and see where we're at. <laughs> yeah. Uh, okay. So, co-founded Gooder in 2015 to create running sunglasses for people who think running is fun. Um, have you always found running fun, or have you? You know, you mentioned there about being in that 323 shape. Have you ever been sucked down the rabbit hole of it being hyper serious? You know, um, I'm very fortunate that. I just started running. You know, my my friend asked me to run. I started running, and I just I just really liked it. I like the work, right? I mean, if you want to be a long distance runner, if you don't like the abuse that is long that is running, I mean, you shouldn't do it because, right? It's a lot of work. Like like the race is the journey is everything. Um, and so for the longest time, I just love doing it, and I would just get better and I get better, and I never. To answer your question, no, I never fell into that seriousness. Um, I, I don't know. I, I think I'm very, very fortunate. I never did it as a, as exercise. Like, right? I, I never, I didn't start doing it to lose weight, anything like that. I did it because I loved it, and then the everything else just fell into place. I mean, I look back at what I looked like when, like, 2017. I was like, oh, like you were, you could get blown away by wind. And at the time I actually didn't even process like how thin I was because it was never about that. It was actually just about how much I loved getting on the side of a trail with friends, shooting the shit, talking about life. And, and so I never let it get bad for me. That's so good. And and that's actually quite rare to, to not have ever let it get to the point where, yeah, it's just, um, so I got to hit this goal. I need to do that. Or, I mean, um, as someone who has, uh, <laughs> gone from being obsessed with finish lines, racing, winning, just, uh, that was all I wanted to, to a place now where I really just enjoy my running, even though I'm drastically slower. Um, it just doesn't bother me anymore because I see that I prefer it this way. So, um, that's really refreshing to hear because you just don't hear that very much. I mean, obviously there's, uh, running is relative and there's some people who my slow right now might be their absolute fastest they would ever run. Um, and so I don't want to insult anyone with that. Speaking of cancel culture again. Um, <laughs> but, uh, we really don't hear that very often of people who just enjoy running and have always done so, um, for the love of it. And, do you think that is part why you were so motivated to to make a, a a running brand because you you did have that passion in such a you were solidified in such a strong way to your why that it made it easier for you to to think about a brand that could embody that? Yeah, it's a good good question. I think that 
you know, Gooder in a lot of ways is a fairy tale, right? We're coming up on six years, 75 people. Um, it, it's been a wild ride, but it's the sixth company I've ever started. Or six, it's the sixth company that I've started or been a part of starting and I've um, failed at the other five. And so it was a really good <laughs> learning experience and very fortunate to your point. It, it hit me, had the idea for Gooder in early 2015 and, you know, was in part of large training groups and, it hit me at the right point where I love um, entrepreneurship and starting companies and business culture and uh, and then I loved running and so I you know you talk about a perfect storm of things that it, it enabled me to like marry two sides of my life that I love and it made working you know two jobs for the first two years of the company uh, easy because I loved it so much and and I think the the one trap I've had to fight against is for the past couple of years, feeling like I should be running more like, like, Oh, you're the CEO of Gooder and it's a, it's a run company. You know, you should be out doing hundred miles again. And, and I've definitely had to be like, no, no, you're no, that's okay. You don't need to prove anything to anybody, but it is feelings that have crept up from time to time of still feeling like I need to prove myself, but I, uh, I've come off the other side of it. For sure. I mean, I think all humans at some point are going to feel that uh, pressure of, of of being on us, of that everyone is watching us and um, that everyone cares what we're doing and is judging us when, as we've said a few times, it's really only us judging ourselves. And you said there about the five failed um, first businesses. So what would you say is the biggest difference looking back now between them and Gooder and why Gooder was a success? Is it that marrying of the two things you love? Yeah. It's, I mean, first of all, so lucky. I mean, you know, just, um, in, in full transparency, right. I, I, the amount of balls I've had to bounce, um, my way in life is quite astounding. And so Mm -hmm. I've just been fortunate. I, one, I hit the birth lottery. I happen to be born a white heterosexual male in America, which means I can do anything like, like, like in like not an ass way. Like, like I, the opportunity that has, was given to me at birth is quite large. I never, ever take that for granted. I had wonderful parents that weren't perfect. I grew up lower middle class, but were loving and like never pushed me to be anything that I didn't want to be taught me to fend for myself very early, which, um, you know, the problem solving that I had to learn as a child, um, led to being able to take on company, you know, take on problem solving inside of a a company and then Mm -hmm. just amazing friends, right? My two co-founders I went to high school with, um, um, the people we've brought in, uh, I've, I've stood on the shoulders of giants to make myself taller. So I've just been very, very fortunate in too many ways to count. Mm-hmm. But, well, I mean, that's really nice that you say that as well. Like you, it could be very easy to just say, yeah, I worked really hard. Um, and I, I did my time and I put in the work and it, and it all kind of worked out for me. And I think that, uh, as, as a, another white person, female, but yes, still, um, I'm born in the UK, which is pretty similar. Um, yeah. I've spent a lot of time unpeeling that layer of uh, or unattaching and unlearning that message of what well, I'm where I am because I worked hard. And yes, it's not taking anything away from that work. I, I did work hard for things, but um, yeah, realizing that there are, there are a lot of components, as you said, with winning the, the, the lottery in some ways with that uh, of, of how the situation you were born in, um, how much that can play a role. So thank you for bringing that up because I think that is an important point to mention. And I know it's something I've been thinking about a lot myself. Um, is there anything else you want to add to that about kind of what you've been thinking about this year or this past few years in terms of, um, uh, just recognizing the privileges that you've had? Man. Um, agree. I mean, yeah, I know I've worked hard, but that's, that is, you know, that, that's part of it. I think that, um, the past year has been crazy, right? I mean, the, a silver lining for, I think a lot of people in this, you know, horrific time is some, some space and time to kind of take inventory and, and gain perspective on life. Um, and then, you know, coming, you know, black lives matter and, um, you know, it, there's been a lot of time for me to just, you know, reflect and um, show gratitude. And so 
it is, I, I think the, the, you know, the last thing I'll say is it is so much. I'm trying to, how would I wrap this up in a nice bow? Uh, I'm very lucky. And, um, I don't, that I don't, I know how hard I work. I work cause I love it. And, and the thing at Gooder that we've the reason we've gotten here is we actually really t- talk about like enjoying the process and, and showing gratitude. And so it, we want to live a we versus I company. And, yeah. um, and that's, that's how, you know, that's how we, we got there is just understanding how amazing this life is and, and, and the amount of people that help us got here is incredible. And, and so we, I don't take it for granted personally or professionally, and I hope nobody good or does either. Yeah. I mean, it doesn't seem to be that way from, from everyone I've interacted with, uh, just, just such a, um, good feeling, good vibe coming from everyone that I've ever interacted with, uh, who either works at Gooder or, um, is, uh, represented by Gooder. Like it's, it's just been definitely all round. I mean, and that's a testament to you. Uh, the culture that you've created there is, is definitely pretty solid and, and obviously very, re- uh, reflective and, and introspective as well. So, um, are you ready to get on to another big passion of mine that my Let's audience are going to probably hold their eyes at? Let's hear it. <laughs> <laughs> okay. They're going to know where this is going, but, uh, Poking around the website, I love that you have on there that Gooder is carbon neutral. Um, yes. Now, for someone who sees that word or those words being thrown around, and we're going to increasingly see that being thrown around, especially as I think carbon is going to become the new like nutritional facts of <laughs> our future world. Um, <laughs> yeah. So, uh, tell us, what, what does carbon neutral mean? And and why did that become an important issue for, for Gooda to, uh, to speak out about and to do things uh, to help? Yeah, I mean, early on, we joined 1% for the planet. And um, which, you know, for your list, for listeners out there who don't know what it is, I mean, basically, there's an organization, it's a nonprofit. Um, it was originally started and funded by Patagonia. But it is, if you sign up for it as a brand like us, you commit through legality. Like we have no choice. We have to donate 1% of our top line revenue to causes that benefit the earth. And we did that. So to hold ourselves accountable. And so it's, you know, it's not an insignificant amount of money. And, you know, throughout the years, we've kind of worked with different organizations, protect our winners, POW, um, uh, other things. And, my uh, one of my co-founders, Ben. This is a passion project of his, and we have these things. We have these things that are called purpose projects, where everybody could spend ten percent of their time on nonprofits or art-related uh, projects. And this was his from a few years ago, and then started looking into. We connected with Protect Our Winners and realizing, like, oh, can we become carbon neutral? And through one percent for the planet, they connected us with different organizations that offset all of our carbon footprint. And so it was something that we're very fortunate that we're able to do, you know, obviously being an athletic brand, runners, cyclists, Mm -hmm. golfers, protecting the outdoors is really, really important to us. And, and so that's, you know, long story short, um, one of my favorite things about running a, a, a successful brand like Gooder is being able to do things like this. Yes. I love that. And uh, from what I what I heard, you donated also to protect our winters and to Cal State Parks as well. So it wasn't just the one percent for the planet last year, correct? For sure, and you know um, a lot of fire relief funds this year. Um, um, we donate to ACLU for Black Lives Matter, uh, and then every year we do two or three uh, uh, partnerships with nonprofits where we make a pair of glasses. We did Special Olympics this last year, and um, all the proceeds we donate to them. So we did Special Olympics, Denver Zoo, Breaking Silence, which is a uh, um, to bring awareness to sexual assault. So um, you know, one percent carbon neutral, and then a, a whole um, array of other nonprofits we give to each year. I love that, and I just want to mention with one percent for the planet, um, uh, Running for Real actually is a member of one percent for the planet awesome. as well. Um, but 
you don't actually have to be a business either. You can do it as an individual. So someone who is interested, you can, uh, I'll put a link in the show notes to 1% for the planet. So you can go check it out. It is, um, as Stephen said, just a really cool um, group of people and the places that they pull their money to go to is just a, a really good portfolio um, of companies. So definitely check it out. Um, so just to wrap this part up, um, well, again, to show that fun personality of good, <laughs> one thing that you have on the website about, um, about climate change is if the world, if the world chooses to ignore the impact of greenhouse gases, our planet will turn into a giant hot pocket. <laughs> and, if, and if you thought the roof, the burnt roof of your mouth was bad, dot, dot, dot. So, uh, if that doesn't show that the climate movement is important, um, Make your your last pitch for the audience to reconsider the way that they think about this and to prepare to um, make some changes within their own lives to uh, like do their part to um, to help get this this word out so we can do something before it's too late. Yeah, I, mean, I think the only thing I can say is lead by example. Um, you know, uh, I don't care. I don't care to engage with people who don't think climate change is real or who think the Earth is flat. Right. Like I'm, I got better things to do with my time and, but for everybody out there, you know, become a member, donate one. It feels good Two, it's, it's not too late. And three leading by example is the only way this works is, is people really, um, real recognizes real. And so just do anything, anything, anything helps. I, I, I will tell the story, Tina, when we first started, one thing that we felt anxiety about was, you know, starting a sunglass company, we sell plastic and, yeah. and we had this moment of like, well, yeah, but what are we going to do? We're a tiny company. And, and that's, that's when we got connected to the 1% for the planet. And we realized like, Hey, you don't have to solve all the world's problems in one go. That's not the expectation, you know, like slight gains are huge. And so we chipped away at it and, you know, we didn't become, we couldn't afford to become carbon neutral until over a year and a half ago. And so there's no easy place to start. You can't solve uh, it all at once, but just start doing anything. Something's better than nothing. Mm-hmm. Progress, not perfection, right? Yeah. And that's the, uh, I think that's the biggest message with the environmental movement. And I have to drill that in my brain on a daily basis because I get so frustrated with kind of the exact thing you mentioned. Um, I bought actually just, this is a random example, but I bought some uh, chai tea bags the other day. And I got home and I opened them up and they were individually wrapped. And I was like, you know, went on the office. <laughs> on this I'm like, these individually wrapped. Why would you individually wrap tea bags? And I, and then I was like, you know what? You didn't know. Let it go. Um, yep. Everyone's going to make mistakes. And, <laughs> but it was just, I got so overly upset about th- that as, as one tiny little thing when, um, that doesn't really make a difference at all, if I'm honest. <laughs> yeah. No, no. So, I mean, even to double down and so your listeners understand some of the stuff that we work with and deal with originally our sunglasses, they came in the box and they were, they came in a plastic bag and we, you know, we taught our manufacturers like, Hey, no more plastic bags. Like we like, this is unnecessary. And they're like, not a problem. But as we grew and got bigger, big corporations or big retailers would want to sell us and we're very selective about it, but a lot of them in their manuals require that plastic bag. And we push back. Like we don't do it for anybody. Giant retailers, we, um, we've either said no to, or, um, we've drew a line in the sand that we were not going to like individually wrap our, um, boxes in a single use plastic. And all of them actually usually love it and respect it and are happy to make an exception for us. Wow. I love that. Wow. If I didn't, if I didn't love the brand already, you've just sold me right there with that. Cause, uh, yeah, ra- wrapping things in plastic uh, is one of my biggest pet peeves. Um, okay. Is there anything else that you would like to share with our listeners, part of your running journey that we haven't gone over or anything, um, about the brand or just that you would like to share from, from your experience, um, as an entrepreneur and someone who has, created this very successful brand and culture. Yeah. I mean, I, I think from a running standpoint, running is really fun. Um, if you can run a mile, you're a runner I, time and distance doesn't matter. I know we sat here, talked earlier about, you know, sub three and hundred miler. Like I didn't, 
that's not how I started. And, and I don't think that anybody needs to uh, enjoy the journey. So do, re- relieve yourself of, of the comparison. That's my advice for a run. And I mean, for entrepreneurship, I actually believe it's the only way that we are going to make real change in the world is to you know, have more small businesses that don't have to um, answer to giant corporations so that they can do more more things like like as you can do way more damage in the system than out of it. So uh, uh, that, that, that that's my pitch to start your own company. I love that. Thank you so much. All right. Well, uh, Stephen, I really appreciate you for coming on here for sharing your story with us, for all that you have done and uh, just making the running world a little more fun. We appreciate you and uh, yeah, thanks for joining me. Thanks, Tina. It's been a pleasure. Before we end this episode, I just want to take a moment to shout out my podcast editor, Jeremy Nessel, who has done such a wonderful job of looking after my podcast, taking out all the mishaps in the episodes, while still keeping in the the vulnerability and the realness and the rawness of the conversation, this is not one of those podcasts where I take out the ums and the errs and the the sometimes the delay in in words because I think it's very important to keep that authenticity. We're surrounded by perfected and manicured everything, and I think it's really important that running for real stays that way. So thank you to Jeremy for your work. I also want to thank Maria Vargas and Amber Moore, who are also part of my team. They've been a big part of this community and me being able to build this brand. So just want to give them a shout out too. All right, let's get right back to the end of this episode. Oh, I'm so thankful to Stephen for his wisdom. And I really enjoyed that interview. I mean, a lot of it was running. Some of it wasn't. We obviously started on a very serious note, but I really appreciate his vulnerability, his openness, his approach to life. There's so much that could be learned from that guy. And I'm really thankful I had that opportunity (laughs) to speak to him and I hope you enjoyed it too. Now, I just want to tell you, um, as kind of hinted at at the beginning, I have, I am starting a a partnership with Gooder. So I want to give you first access to my code, which is going to be if you go to gooder.com forward slash Tina, that's gooder.com forward slash Tina, you will be able to get 15% off your order. Um, And I am just really excited about them. That is, uh, I just want to let you know, actually, that's one per customer. And that is going to be valid through the end of the month. I am going to be working with them on something special. Uh, Hopefully, um, after the end of the month, we will have a different code for something different. Actually, sorry, the code will be the same, but the offer will be different. So through the end of the month, you can get 15% off your entire order at gooda.com forward slash Tina or use code Tina for 15% off your order. Okay, so you heard from Stephen there. I'll put lots of links in the show notes, lots of things we mentioned in the show notes. You can go to those at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 231. And I am excited that next week we'll be having Amelia Boone on the show. So I look forward to hearing your thoughts on that one. Thanks so much for listening. Have a great week. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.